Morning. Here's, here's what I really do for a living. I'm at a, a trade show. Uh, and I know what you were all doing last night. So uh, when people ask me, what do you do for a living? I basically say, I go out and I talk to groups of hungover people. Um, I do a lot of things in Vegas. And you know, I'll have an audience of 7,000 people out there. And they're all sitting there glassy-eyed. And you're kind of going, OK. Like, you know, uh, is anybody actually going to listen to what's going on here? Um, and I do have kind of a, a bizarre job. I go out and talk to a lot of different organizations um, about the future, about trends, about innovation. Uh, here is where I was last Monday. I was brought in by the NASA Goddard Space Center to talk to them about future trends. And I was kind of freaked out. You know, I drove in the main gate. 11,000 people work on site uh, at NASA Goddard outside of Baltimore. And this is what they had at the main gate, you know, welcoming me to, uh, to the site. You know, I was kind of freaked out when they booked me because these are really smart people. I'm talking to astrophysicists. I'm talking to people who manage the Hubble telescope. I'm talking to people who are putting up, you know, uh, satellites into space to figure out deep cosmological things. And you know what they said to me, you know, we're really smart people, but, but our people need to understand something. And what they need to understand is that the business of space is changing. In the grand scheme of things, if we think out 10, 20 years, you know, it used to be just NASA, it used to be just government, it used to be just Russia was in the business of space. But we now have private space entrepreneurs. Everything is changing. Business models are changing. And so we need to comprehend the world in a new and different way. So I want to talk to you today about where we're going in the world of healthcare, where we're going in terms of the big transformative trends that are going to change and shape our world. So I speak at a lot of conferences, a lot of leadership events. I was with a pharmaceutical company up in New Jersey yesterday with seven executives talking about the future of their industry. Regardless of whom I'm talking to, I start every presentation with three observations, three statistics. Now, I do a lot of research. I go into a lot of industries. But three statistics really put in perspective the rate of change in which we find ourselves today. The very first comes from a study that was done in Australia. They looked at the education system. How quickly is the world changing? How quickly is knowledge evolving? They've come to the conclusion 65% of the kids who are in preschool today will work in jobs or careers that don't even yet exist. Think about that. You have someone in kindergarten, grade one. The likelihood is 7 out of 10 are going to work in a job or career that doesn't even yet exist. But let me spin that around. How many of you today carry around in your pocket a smartphone? Hold up your hands, everybody, right? You know, you know the cell phones in the new fashion? Your social standing, a study has said, your social standing depends upon the technology that you carry around. In other words, if you go to a party, you take out a flip phone, people are looking at you, what a loser. You know, you got something from the olden days. But here's, here's what you need to think about. We've got smartphones in our pockets. We've got GPS in our pockets. And we're in this world in which we've had the rapid emergence of all this spatial, S-P-A-T-I-A-L, geographic-oriented information. And there is the emergence right now of a profession of people known as location intelligence professionals. Think about that. Think about what they're doing. Every single industry I go into, people who are wrapping together smartphone technology with the spatial geographic information, coming up with new ways of analyzing and thinking about business applications or business strategies or consumer interaction, new ways of doing new things. And it's a, it's a career that is emerging before our very eyes. Second observation comes from a US study done on science education. And they've looked at how quickly our world has changed. And they basically have concluded, if we are taking any type of degree today based on science, so anything agriculture, architecture, engineering, mechanical engineering, you know, anything medical, we are in a situation in which half of what we learn in our very first year of a college or a university program is obsolete or revised by the time we graduate. Look around the show floor there. Think about how quickly the change is occurring you know, with manufacturing methodologies, with robotics, with new means of you know, streamlining how we do a manufacturing process. And put yourself in the mindset that you know, the, the context in which we are dealing with the world around us, the phrase that captures our attention, learning is what most adults will do for a living in the 21st century. You know, if you think about coming back to the show in 2017, 2018, when you come here, Nothing out there is going to look like it does today. It's all going to be different. Because there is so much innovation occurring. There's so much change occurring. And half of what we learn in our very first year of a college or university program is obsolete by the time we graduate. Third observation. 
You know, I, I, I spoke at the uh, Consumer Electronic Association CEO Summit. I right, the CEO of uh, Nike and Reebok, you know, all these, uh, you know, high-tech companies. And, 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 you know, was talking with a digital camera manufacturer, he made the observation when they bring a typical digital camera to the marketplace, they figure they've got about three to six months to sell it before it's obsolete. Before it's obsolete. Product life cycles are collapsing. You know, the time to market, the time in which we can get a product to market before it's obsolete is shrinking. Remember the whole concept of, of product life cycle? You know, you, you took that marketing course years ago. I, I dug out my marketing textbook from 1996 and it talked about product life cycle. Remember a product starts to sell and it hits market maturity, you know, and eventually it, you know, it, it, it settles off. And I looked at the x-axis on that graph 20 years. I think it was like for a fridge. We're in a situation when, now in which you know, products are almost obsolete by the time they come to market. And that's why one of my favorite quotes comes from Rupert Murdoch, a global media magnet. He made the observation, if you think, what is going on? There is so much change occurring, and it's happening so rapidly. It's happening at such a speed that increasingly it's not big organizations that will win and own and control the future, it's the past. It's those who can scale, it's those who can bring an idea to the market and get it out there in time. You know, and one thing I always like to do with my audience is, is you know, try and get a perspective as to how you think you're doing when it comes to this fast future. So we're going to do a little poll. I want to do a text message poll. You know, because as a speaker, you know people are sitting there in the audience, they're looking at their phones. So we've got to get you involved. So here's what we're going to do. I, I want to ask you, when it comes to the fast future, do you think you're extremely well positioned for success? Take out your phone and send a text message to the number 22333. If you think you're extremely well positioned for success, you punch in 135388. If you think you're toast, it's going way too fast, you punch in 135457. If you're under the age of 25, you know how to tweet, send a tweet to app poll space, one of these numbers, and we'll get your vote in. And I want to tell you two little stories that relate to what is going on here when we do this type of poll. It's down in Austin, Texas last year. It's speaking to the Texas Credit Union League. I had 600 CEOs for credit unions, large and small, throughout the greatest state of Texas in the room. You know, and I'm looking up, you know, from stage, I'm looking out over the room. The average age seemed to be 55 plus. And I could see a whole bunch of baby boomer CEOs in the room. And they're all sort of talking to each other and all sort of going, I don't know how to text. Do you know how to text? Do you know what to do? I can't participate in this thing. Think about what's going on in the world of banking in the context of the future belongs to those who are fast. The credit cards that we carry around in our pockets, they're about to disappear because our cell phones are about to become credit cards. Near field communications are going to put credit card technology inside of our iPhones, inside of our Android devices. It's going to cause havoc within the banking industry. And here I've got a room full of bankers who don't even know how to use the technology, which is going to cause such fundamental change in their industry. Contrast that when I went into my son's high school. I had 300 kids in the auditorium. I walked out on stage and I said, I understand I'm in a high school. You're not supposed to be uh, using your cell phones in class. Take them out because we're going to do a poll. 297 out of 300 kids responded in the first 35 seconds. That's your next customer. That's your next employee. That's the next individual you know, who you are going to have to manage or you're going to have to sell to. And they are wired differently. They think differently. So let's see what we're thinking here. You know, well, we're somewhat positioned for success, but we're not quite there. We've got a few confident people in the room. But the majority of the room is feeling, wow, this guy's freaking me out already. The world is so fast. Maybe I'm not really positioned for success. 7% of you voted, you know, we're toast. It's way too fast. These were the people making friends with their minibar last night. They're not feeling good about anything, right? They're, they're a major hangover city. They're just not thinking positive. Here's, here's why this matters. You know, I deal with a tremendous number of different organizations who are struggling with the issue of how do we keep up with a world in which change is happening so fast. I'm in the home office, you know, four years ago. My wife works with me in the phone, home office and the phone rings and it's the Walt Disney Corporation on the line. And, you know, somebody from Disney is saying to me, we would like you to come in and talk to us about creativity and innovation. And going to my wife, it's Disney on the phone. And I'm sure you've been to a conference where somebody from Disney 
you know, has been talking about creativity or innovation. They are the most creative, innovative organization on the planet. And they're seeking help. What's going on? Think about what happened to Disney. The entertainment broadcast model was changing. Streaming technology was arriving. Social networking was having an impact on the way that fans interacted with the show. You know, they brought the uh, show Hannah Montana, you know, to television. All of a sudden, you know, people are talking about it on Facebook, on, on MySpace. You know, it was back in the day when MySpace was big. And they're realizing the manner of fan interaction is changing. And they're realizing, we don't know what to do anymore. We need to change our culture to deal with a world in which, in, in which change is happening faster than ever before. And that's what I want to focus on today. <clears throat> I spend my time with a tremendous number of different organizations in different industries. And I've had the op opportunity to learn and observe what some are doing to keep ahead of fast-paced tr trends and what others have not. And I've sort of developed this theory of what is it that world-class innovators do that others don't do? And what can we learn from them? You know, maybe there are some things that organizations are doing that help them to keep up with this world of rapid, incessant change. Here's the very first thing I learned. World-class innovators focus on innovation. They focus on opportunity. They focus on growth, despite lingering economic uncertainty. You know, think about where we are today. You know, apparently we're witnessing the death of American manufacturing. You look around this trade show, certainly doesn't look like it's going on. But a lot of what has to do with innovation concerns our mindset, concerns, you know, how we're approaching the future. Forbes magazine, Fortune magazine, everybody's writing about this. The biggest problem in American business today is uncertainty. You know, we're not quite sure when we're going to see an economic recovery. And do you know what begins to happen if we cloud our minds with the thinking that, you know, I'm not quite sure when we're going to see a recovery? We become indecisive. I'm not going to make this capital investment. I'm not going to focus on this retraining program. I'm not going to focus on defining new opportunities because I'm not quite sure when we're going to see an economic recovery. When we had the last economic downturn in 2002, I coined a phrase. I said, what I, what I see happening with a lot of my clients is they're going into a state of aggressive indecision. Think about that phrase, aggressive indecision. Are you in that mindset where you're, where you're deferring the things that you should do in terms of innovation and opportunity because you're not quite sure when we're going to see an economic recovery. And I've seen this happen over and over and over again. June 2009, I went into Cedar Rapids, Iowa. I was going to see Rockwell Collins, one of the world's largest aerospace organizations. It was a leadership meeting, 200 executives in the room. I get to Cedar Rapids, Iowa, get my rental car, get in the rental car, and turn on the radio. You ever watch the Discovery Channel? They have these uh, disaster shows. You know, this guy with this really deep voice does these disaster so shows. So when I fly away somewhere, my, my son will put on a show, the world's worst airplane disasters, right? This guy with this really deep voice, you know, is talking about, you know, planes crashing. That guy is on the radio in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. He's talking about this book. He's sort of going, you know, we're going through the worst economic downturn since the Great Depression. You know, there's not a lot of hope. There is no upside. You should be buying food and stocking up on gold. And what you really need to be doing is buying this book called the Ultimate Depression Survival Guide. You know, I'm driving down the road, and I'm, everybody's driving a Ford 150 truck. People are looking healthy. There's nobody dead at the side of the road. And I'm thinking, really? But I get to Rockwell Collins. Here I meet a bunch of executives who are so dispirited by what is going on with the economic downturn. They are convinced there is no hope in the global aerospace industry. They are convinced that this great depression that is upon us, you know, has such an impact that, you know, they should just sit and wait a while, you know, for an economic recovery to come back before they make big, bold decisions. They were in a state of aggressive indecision. And that's not where great innovators want to be. So the second poll I want to do with you is to ask you the question, when do you think we'll see a global economic recovery? You know, do you think it's happening right now? You text your, your text to 22333. And if you think it's happening right now, you punch in 115242. Uh, if you think it's going to be three to six months, 115255. And I want you to think about something else while we do this poll. How many of you have been to a conference in the last couple of years where when you've gone into the conference room, they've handed you a polling stick? 
they've outfitted the conference with this cool hardware that lets you do polling in the room, right? You know, that was a really cool technology two years ago. I'm running this off a service in the cloud. To outfit a room like this with that polling hardware, which was really cool just two years ago, will probably cost twenty to thirty thousand dollars. That technology is old, it's dead, it's obsolete, it's irrelevant, it's something from the olden days. Because the future belongs to those who are fast, where there's rapid change, you know, which is occurring. Here's what's so fascinating about this poll that we're doing right now. I've been doing this poll for the last seven years. Um, with you know 60 audiences a year, seven years, 420 events. Every single audience for the last seven years, the majority answer in the room, except for one industry, the majority answer in the room has been that you know the economic recovery is you know six months to two years away. We're more than two years away. Everybody I'm dealing with for the last seven years tells me the economic recovery is sometime far away in the future, except for one industry, and that one is industry is you guys, manufacturing. I was in Las Vegas <coughs> a year ago, September, speaking to a thousand manufacturing executives, you know, from, from manufacturing companies large and small, and put out this text message poll, and the majority answer came back just like it did today, you know, that we think it's happening right now. I was up in Ohio, 250 manufacturing executives, and we were being webcast to seven locations in Canton and Columbus and elsewhere with an audience of about a thousand people and the majority answer came back, it's happening right now. If you look around what is going on in the world of American manufacturing, there is a renaissance that is underway due to robotics, change in process, transformation of, of how we do things. And nobody seems to realize it but you guys. But understand this, if you were in the group that voted six months, two years, more than two years, are you suffering from aggressive indecision? Are you postponing the decisions that you should be making to invest in the future because you're not quite sure when we're going to see a global economic recovery? Here's why it matters. Fellow at General Electric, their head of innovation, did a study. He looked at what companies did during previous periods of economic decline. He looked at the oil shock in the 70s. He looked at the downturn of the 1980s, the 1990 recession, the what happened with the dot-com bust. 60% of the organizations that he studied barely survived. You know, they did what they had to do to get through. They cut costs, they managed costs, they let staff go. They didn't make any big, bold decisions. 30% didn't make it. There's always casualties. But 10% became breakthrough performers. And that's because they specifically decided, despite lingering economic uncertainty, right now is a time that we should be making big, bold decisions and be doing big, bold things. When you look out over the show floor there, there's a lot of advanced technology. There's a lot of advanced methodology. There are a lot of things that can transform your business. And you can walk around the show floor and kind of go, wow, but I'm going to wait a little while before I get involved in that stuff because I'm not quite certain when we're going to see an economic recovery and my business is going to be safe. Or you can walk around and look at that stuff and go, wow, what an opportunity for transformation. I should be getting involved with this stuff right now. Because as the economy comes roaring back, I'm going to be positioned for success. That is what world-class innovators do. They are prepared to take risk despite uncertainty. What world-class innovators do is they check their speed. They're willing to challenge themselves to act and think fast. Think how quickly our world has changed. Think about five things that didn't exist you know, 10 years ago. Ten years ago, we didn't have Facebook, we didn't have Twitter, we didn't have iPods, iPhones, we didn't have Google Maps, we didn't have the concept of location intelligence professionals. We didn't have the concept that we're rapidly <coughs> going into a world in which packaging is becoming intelligent and it's going to link to all the social networks which are becoming a part of the world and we're going to be able to build relationships with customers in new and different ways. Think about how quickly the world is changing. Now, what was really big just five years ago? Five years ago, Research Emotion and BlackBerry was a real cool brand. And look how quickly they went from hero to zero. And now, perhaps, in recovery phase. Five, you know, it was just five years ago, cars were starting to arrive with built-in GPS. And we were kind of going, how cool is that? Five years ago, the Apple App Store was, a, was appearing for the very first time. Google Street View was becoming a part of our life. Now these things are as common as nails. You know what's so interesting about what is going on? 
what is so interesting, if you're a futurist, like me, where you think about future trends, what is so darn interesting is we are in a world in which science fiction is becoming reality faster than ever before. A lot of us grew up with the Jetsons. I'm looking around the room, a lot of baby boomers, and we grew up with the Jetsons. You know, we watched George Jetson reading his news off a screen. We would watch George Jetson, you know, talking to his boss via screen. We now realize that what he was doing, he was logging on to FaceTime to talk with his boss, and he was reading his news off the internet. You know, when I was at NASA last week, I've got all these space scientists, people throwing rockets up into space. I had to put up a picture of Spock. There was some way I had to put up a picture of Spock in front of all these astrophysicists. So the picture I chose about Spock was the picture of Spock with the medical tricorder. And here we are at a medical device conference, and we're thinking about the medical tricorder. You know, it was a magical device that Spock had that he could simply place next to a person, and it would instantly diagnose and instantly cure them of any medical ailment. We live in a world in which science fiction is becoming real faster than ever before. The folks with the XPRIZE, they've put together a $10 million prize um, for anyone who can come up with a tricorder to take what was science fiction and bring it to our world. And do you know what's going on? Some of the folks at NASA Ames, which is another division of NASA, are actually working on the Scanadu Scout, which is a medical tricorder, which will do blood pressure, which will do oxygenation of your blood, which will do an EKG. It's a medical tricorder. And they're doing this in an effort to win the prize. I was one of the first 200 people to buy one. Because I believe we live in a world in which science fiction is becoming fa fact faster than ever before. You know, if we wander around the show floor and we think about medical device technology, you know, what it's going to look like in five years, it's not going to look anything like it does today. Because we are in a world that involves a whirlwind of change. What world-class world innovators do is they're prepared to act fast to take advantage of emerging opportunities. <coughs> they do that by aligning themselves to longer-term trends. Bill Gates once made the observation you know, if you think about it, for a lot of folks, they tend to overestimate the rate of change that's going to occur on a two-year basis. They really underestimate the rate of change that's going to occur on a 10-year basis. Now think about that. Where are we going to be in the world 2023? What is this conference going to look like? What is medical device technology going to look like? How big are these transformative changes going to be that are going to occur? And what I've learned is not a lot of people can think like that. You know, I was over in Stuttgart, Germany, 2004. This is the Daimler Chrysler. It was the newly merged entity of Chrysler and Mercedes-Benz. And it was a small meeting, you know, it was to talk about the auto industry of 2015, what might it look like. So I had 10 engineers from Chrysler, 10 engineers from Mercedes-Benz, and I was there as the futurist to stir things up. You know what these folks talked about the entire first morning for the first two hours when it came to 2015? All they talked about was what their competition would be doing 10 years out. Their conversation sort of went that, you know, Honda's going to do this, and, you know, Ford might be doing that, and Toyota might do this, and, you know. All they could conceive is that their competition 10 years out would be their existing competition today. I finally said to them, folks, I don't think you get it. I think we live in a world of disruptive business model innovation. I think we could have a car company in 2015 that doesn't exist today, who is changing the rules of the auto industry. And they said, that's not going to happen. The auto industry, it's too capital intensive. It takes too much money to get involved. You know, the, the, you can't simply enter the auto industry. It's, it's way too big. And I said, no, I don't think you understand the way our world is changing. They said to me, give us an example. That moment in time, I had my laptop open. I had Google Maps on the screen. And, you know, remember the first time you saw Google Maps? It was really cool. And I said, well, how about this? How about by 2015, Google has become a car company. I said, here's what's going to happen. We could have a couple of auto engineers in Google headquarters right now. They're looking at Google Maps. And one of them says, you know, this is really cool. We should build a car around this. We got this really cool navigation technology. Let's build a car around the navigation technology. And I said, what Google is going to do, they're not actually going to build the car. 
They're simply going to line up with a, with a manufacturer to build the car on their behalf. They're going to line up with manu existing manufacturer, Brazil, India, China, Tennessee, doesn't matter where. I said, Google you know, understands we're in a world of disruptive business model innovation. They're going to change the distribution model. I said, no one likes going to an auto dealer to buy a car. They're going to sell the car to you online. I said, Google's going to be very much in a partnership. Logistics. They're going to arrange with FedEx to have the car delivered to your driveway. And I said, Google understands this world of social media marketing, viral marketing buzz, which was beginning to emerge back in 2004. So what's going to happen when you open up the Google car box? Because it's going to be in a box delivered by FedEx. You're going to find the Google car party in a box. And it's going to have Google car streamers and hats and horns, confetti, wine. You're going to throw the Google car party. You're going to be the coolest person in the neighborhood because you got the coolest car from the coolest car company on the planet. How do you think these very serious auto engineers in Stuttgart, Germany, are reacting to the idea of Google becoming a car company? Maybe the way some of you are reacting right now, that's the dumbest thing I ever heard, right? Stupidest idea I ever heard. Will never happen. Tesla Motor, folks. Tesla Motors, manufactured in California, electric hybrid vehicle. Uh, doesn't come in a box, doesn't come via FedEx. You can actually buy the darn thing online. Doesn't come with party. But the equity founders of Tesla Motors, the founder of PayPal, Elon Musk, the founder of SpaceX, the guy who's throwing rockets into space, which is changing the business space, and the two primary owners of Google. Essentially, it's the Google car, where we've had folks who've looked at an industry and said, we can do big things, we can make bold decisions, we can transform an industry in very significant ways. And what is happening with Tesla Motors, if you think about what is going on, they are changing the manufacturing process. They are changing the design process. They are shifting the concept of how we get a product to market from the old methodologies of Detroit to the new methodologies of Silicon Valley. This is so foundational change, it's simply staggering. Think about what is going on. And let's think about the auto industry. You know, what could be really big just five years from now in the auto industry? You know, we could be in a situation in which we've got a Siri button in every car because, you know, Apple is cutting deals with automobiles, so you're going to talk to your car. We could be in a situation in which we've got augmented reality screens built into the screen of our automobile. We could be in a situation in which we've got glasses-free 3D dashboards. We could have interactive in-car billboards. I could buy a package, and embedded in that package is a SIM card, and that SIM card talks to the SIM card in my car and it runs an interactive commercial on the augmented reality dashboard in front of me. Far-fetched, where we are going with the world of intelligent packaging is absolutely staggering. We could have credit card technology embedded into the car as well. So when we go through a drive through there's no transaction. It simply talks to the SIM card in my car. And let's think big in terms of what is going on in the world of healthcare. Imagine what is happening in the world of healthcare. When we bring together information technology, biology, and engineering, and it allows us to move a lot of healthcare out of hospitals, out of clinics, out of doctors' offices, and into our everyday lives. We are on the precipice of an era of bioconnectivity, where Silicon Valley is going to redefine the future of healthcare by bringing us opportunities that we can only just begin to imagine. You know, I was talking to this pharmaceutical company up in New Jersey yesterday. You know, I made a little joke, you know, things could get out of hand. We're in this trend in which everything is going to plug into everything else. You know, maybe one morning I'll get up, I'll get on my way scale. It's going to send an email to my fridge, you know, don't let Jim in today. He's not living up to the terms of his wellness contract. But think about what is happening here. By applying biosensors to the body, physiological capabilities to monitor blood pressure, glucose, oxygen concentration, it takes us to a new world. You know, think about where we're going. We have this panoramic, high-definition, relatively comprehensive view that a patient can you know, provide to their doctor that changes the nature of the relationship. Think about what is already emerging. The Wythings Wi-Fi blood pressure cuff. I'm 54 years old. I'm in a good fitness regimen. I'm down 35 pounds. You know, and when you're 54 years old, hypertension is a concern. And so every morning, you know, I get up and I put on the cuff, plug it into my iPhone, and it, you know, it takes a reading. 
and builds all these charts and graphs and motivational data that help to keep you on the path towards a good health regimen. Think about what is happening here. Think about what is happening here with the digitization of the human, the digitization of the patient, and a world in which what we are witnessing is the creative destruction of medicine. Because we know medicine and healthcare isn't working really well right now. We know that there are tremendous challenges and demands being placed upon the system. And think about how quickly this has unfolded. It took Apple two years to sell two million iPhones. Yet when they brought out the iPad, it took them only two months to sell two million iPads. And look at the app. That's my blood pressure right there. Doing pretty well, doing pretty good. You know, what is happening here is patients are changing in their behavior. When Apple brought out the iPhone 4, it took them only one month to sell one million of those. Think about the number of apps emerging. With pinprick technology that you plug into your iPhone, by which you can do your own glucose monitoring if you're diabetic. When Apple brought out the iPhone 4S, it took only one day to sell one million of those. And we are carrying around entire healthcare encyclopedias in our pockets. When they brought out the iPhone 4S, they sold five million of those in the first four days. And what is happening here is patient behavior is being transformed through bioconnectivity. You know, when it comes to wireless health, when it comes to the marriage of technology to mobile devices, 78% of consumers are interested in it. Medical and healthcare apps are the third fastest growing category on the Apple Android store. The Apple App Store now has 17 healthcare apps, and 80, 60% of them are aimed at the consumer. It is estimated 500 million mobile users, or about 30% of smartphone users, will be using some type of mobile healthcare, wellness, fitness app by 2015. Think about what is happening here. I was with this uh, pharmaceutical company yesterday. I said, what is really occurring here is the patient is changing. The patient is getting more involved with their health, more involved in understanding and managing their healthcare circumstances. This is huge. This is massive. And this is where medical device technology is going to take us in the next 10 years. The future belongs to those who are fast and can take advantage of these opportunities. To do that, world-class innovators, you know, they redefine the very concept of innovation. Innovation is one of those funny words. You know, we hear the word innovation, we think of the late Steve Jobs. We think that innovation <coughs> is for cool people who design really cool products that change the world. You know, I work with a small medical device manufacturing company. I, I can't innovate. But that's the wrong way to think about it. I went on this uh, CNBC show called The Business of Innovation with Maria Baratoroma. I thought it was going to be this nice interview. You know, Jim, tell me about some of the companies you work with and their, their secrets of innovation success. And it turned into one of these weird American talk shows. Everybody's screaming at everybody else. I, I, I couldn't figure it out. But I got my point across. My point was innovation is about much more than just the development of new products. Here's how you need to think about innovation. You need to look at what you are doing in your business and continually ask yourself, what can I do to run my business better? What can I do to grow my business? And what can I do to transform my business? And the big opportunity comes in number three. There is a massive opportunity today to transform the business of healthcare. You know, one of the biggest uh, trends going on in the world of healthcare today is the rapid trend towards virtual care. We are in a situation in which the hospital, as we know it, is coming to an end. I was out in Austin, Texas in uh, 2009, in May, and I was speaking at a conference called Facilities 09 for the National Association of Children's Hospitals. And, you know, one of the uh, uh, CEOs of one of the hospitals said, you know, we think out to 2015, 2020, the hospital as we know it isn't going to exist. We're not going to be able to build all these healthcare facilities, and we are going to have much more in terms of community care, in terms of home care, because we are going to be able to use the extension of medical monitoring technology out to the home, out to the patient, so that we can manage and monitor and care for them from afar. Trends are occurring so quickly with virtual care. There are health care facilities in the US who are already doing Skype consultations for their patients. It is evolving so quickly 
that doctors are of a mindset that we could eliminate 11 to 30 percent of office visits through the use of mobile health technologies like remote monitoring, text messaging, email consultations. There is a massive shift going on with the estimate that you know, th this remote and mobile monitoring technology is going to grow from $7.7 .7 billion to $43 billion in just a few short years. Get ready for e-visits. You know, where the healthcare system is already beginning to think, you know, do you actually need to come into the office? Or if we have remote monitoring technology, you know, we can cut that down to a huge degree. People are thinking even bigger than that. Alzheimer's, dementia, huge growing crisis in the U.S. You know, the good thing about healthcare is we're all going to live longer. The bad thing about healthcare is we're going to be dealing with Alzheimer's and dementia for a longer period of time. It used to be we'd deal with an Alzheimer's patient, a loved one, a, a parent, grandparent, for five to ten years. We can now be in a situation in which we are dealing with an Alzheimer's patient for 30 to 40 years. We lost my father to Alzheimer's two years ago, and we went through all the tragedy and complexity that is the, the disease. And you know, years ago at the University of Missouri, they started thinking about community care. They started thinking, you know, we're not going to be able to build nursing home facilities, you know, for all the baby boomers you know, who are going to be in their retirement years. We're going to be in a system of home care, community care. They're going to have to live at home longer. So why don't we see if we can use technology, you know, that can monitor them, monitor the health of older adults who are living at home? What if we had motion sensor networks, you know, that, 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 that watch their behavior? And if things skewed out of normal, watch their sleeping patterns and things seem odd, then we call for a medical intervention. Science fiction. You know, they were talking about this six years ago. Wild science fiction. Well, not to the folks who brought out the Med Cottage. The Med Cottage is a one-bedroom cottage designed to be lowered into the backyard of a family who is caring for a senior who's going to live in their backyard. And built in the Med Cottage, webcams, monitoring technologies, all kinds of sophisticated stuff that allow the senior to live in the comfort of their own home, in the backyard of their children, while having a degree of independence. You know, the state of Virginia has actually passed a bylaw that pre prohibits any city or town putting in place a law that would disallow the placement of a med cottage in the backyard. The state of Ohio plans to shift their spending on community care from 2.9% of their, their, their health care budget to 4.5% in just three years. Fascinating article about the Bed Cottage in the New York Times that puts in perspective. Monitoring and in home technolo monitoring technologies will be a $20 billion marketplace by the year 2020. Home health care is currently 3% of the U.S. national health budget, but it's growing at 9% per year. And it's people who are thinking of you know, big, bold schemes like the Med Cottage, who are world class innovators, who are redefining the future. Think about the reality of the trend that is occurring here. The number of visits to hospitals is going to decrease. And the number of things we do in the world of healthcare involving virtual care and telemedicine and remote and bioconductivity and community care is going to increase. How do you discover opportunity through technology in this world of rapid change? What world-class innovators do is they align themselves to the acceleration of business cycles. They know that we're in a world in which product life cycles are collapsing. Do you know that Apple is in a situation where 60% of their revenue comes from products that didn't exist four years ago? And ask yourself, can you do that in your company? Could you find yourself five years from now, and you're in a situation in which you have changed so much your capability, your agility, your manufacturing process, your products, your markets, your customer interactions, that 60% of your revenue comes from products that didn't exist four years ago? You know, I regularly deal with organizations, you know, who are in a mindset and they realize that product life cycles are collapsing. I was at the company called FMC Lithium. Lithium is a component product used in electric cars. It's a product used in um, um, cholesterol, statin-lowering drugs. And, you know, I was talking with the CEO and he said, you know, what is coming, the emergence of LED television technology. It was about eight years ago. And he said, you know, lithium is going to be a, a component product in that. We have an opportunity to get into that market and sell into that market. And we've got to do it really fast. And that market is only going to last for a short period of time. He said, our success as a company comes from our ability 
to get into a market, capitalize on the opportunity, and get out before the product life cycle collapses. And what we need to do to succeed as a company is to be able to do that in many different marketplaces. Look what happened with LED TVs. Went from 9.4 to 21 to $35 billion, just like that. And you see the new television technology emerging today? OLED TV. It's like saran wrap. You go into a hotel that has this technology, it's like a little plastic screen on the mirror, right? And it's coming at us fast and furious, and it's gonna replace LED TVs. The reality of product life cycles, New product revenue hit 34% for most organizations by 2007. That was up from 21%. More than 70% of the sales of a typical manufacturer will become obsolete over six years. The fashion and high tech industry, you know, that's down to one to two years. And what is happening is Silicon Valley takes over the pace of innovation. That number increasingly collapses. I was with one CEO and he said, you know what we, what we gotta do? We have to generate chameleon revenue. We have to be an organization that continually you know, has the capability to, to, to create new streams of revenue from new products that don't even yet exist and keep those products coming in order to survive. And think about what is going on with the world of connected medicine. Think about what's going on with packaging. You know, we're in this world of interactive packaging, intelligent packaging, active packaging, multi-sensory packaging. Packaging, which from a pharmaceutical perspective, you know, tells us how well the patient is adhering to a prescription. You know, you look at what's going on with Proteus, Proteus, actual medical prescription pills, you know, which, which actively report on how well they are working. We're headed to a world in which, you know, millions of Americans will be tethered to gadgets that will automatically send their vital signs to healthcare professionals, and they will be using pills tagged with digestible sensors. We're getting into a world of intelligent packaging, you know, packaging you know, from a basic perspective that for a patient you know, on a particular pharmaceutical regimen, it glows to advise the patient when they should be adhering to taking their prescription. We're headed to a world in which there's development of apps to motivate, you know, the patient to take their prescription on a regular basis. Simple little app that Target is using. You know, that if you take your prescription and you record it, you get rewarded with gift cards or donations, you know, to charities. We're in a world in which, you know, there's all kinds of things happening with fascinating technologies. The biggest trend that is occurring is when you look out over the show floor, the source of innovation of all this technology is gonna change. The source of innovation is going to shift from the people in this room to Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley has the entire medical device industry in their sights because they view it as one of the biggest opportunities going forth into the future. We live in a period of time that involves massive transformative change to the world of healthcare. You know, we are shifting in the world of healthcare. If you want to think in simple terms where we're going, right now we are a system in which we fix you after you're sick. But with genomic DNA-based medicine, we can look at a couple hundred strands of your DNA, and we will know what you are going to become sick with or what you are susceptible to. And if you think about what that means in the longer term trend, it might take five years, 10 years, 15 years, we're going to turn the healthcare system upside down. We are a system in which we fix you after you're sick to a system in which we know what you're sick with and we re-architect the delivery of healthcare resources based upon that knowledge. Here's where it gets so darn interesting. Moore's Law. What is Moore's Law? Many of you will know Moore's Law. Moore's Law is the computer industry law that defines that the processing power of a computer chip cuts in half, doubles every year, and the cost cuts in half. And what is happening right now with genomic sequencing machines is they are being subjected to the rules of Moore's law. The processing power doubles every year and the cost cuts in half. This has dramatic implications on how quickly this transformative shift in the world of healthcare will occur. You know it cost $3 billion to sequence the first human genome. By 2009 that was down to $100,000. It's now under $10,000 and it's estimated by the end of the year it's gonna be a thousand bucks. Five years from now, we will be able to walk into a radio shack and buy a little $5 human genomic sequencing machine to do our own genomic sequence testing to figure out what we are at risk for. I say that as a joke. It's probably not a joke. We're probably going to be able to do that. Some company is going to bring that out. And this is providing for massive transformative change in the world of healthcare. Add to this the context 
of the biggest trend to occur in the next 10 years. And that is every device that is part of our lives is going to be plugged in. Every device that is part of our daily life is going to have an address on the internet. We're going to be aware of its location, and we're going to be aware of its status. So my little joke earlier, you know, one morning I'll get up, I'll get on my way scale. It's going to send an email to my fridge, you know, don't let Jim in today. He's not living up to the terms of his wellness contract. I get up in the morning. I get on my Wyden's Wi-Fi body scale. It takes my BMI, takes my body fat mass, takes my weight, transmits it via Wi-Fi to a password-protected website, which builds all these cool graphs and charts, you know, and motivational stuff, which keeps me on the right track, you know, in terms of weight loss goals. What happens when we get massive hyperconnectivity throughout the world of medicine? What happens when we get massive connectivity into the packaging you know, that surrounds us, in which we encapsulate our pharmaceutical products? What happens when everything around us is plugged in? You know, by 2017, we could be in a situation in which we have packaging that talks to you. We have pharma packaging that does electronic adherence you know, electronic event monitoring for how well it is working. We have packaging, you know, that automatically, you know, uploads calorie, carb, sodium, and other data to a smartphone. We have packaging, you know, with a unique code. We're doing this in India. You know, if you get a pharmaceutical, you can send a text message with the serial number on the box, and it will tell you if it's counterfeit or not. And packaging that lights up when you pick it up, which is the bottle that you see there. Current bottle of Bombay Sapphire. You pick it up in the store, it's got all this magical LED te technology built into it, and it lights up. How cool is that in terms of when you have a party and you got the most cool bottle of booze in the house? You know there is actually a bottle of booze you can buy now that has built into it an LED TV screen that is linked to your phone, and you can have it sitting on the counter in your house party, and you can send messages or video to it. You think about how quickly packaging is going to change as we get into this world of massive connectivity. World-class innovators take advantage of this stunning change in connectivity. Last but not least, world-class innovators ride generational acceleration. Let me ask a little question. How many of you, the very first computer course you ever took involved learning COBOL, BASIC, or FORTRAN? Hold up your hands and look around, look around the crowd here. Most of us, baby boomers, we are the only generation in the history of mankind who ever met the punch card. And it told us, do not fold, spindle, or mutilate. We still don't know what spindle means. And you know what happened here? Every generation before us never had to deal with technology. My great-grandparents never had to deal with this stuff. My grandparents never had to deal with technology. I've got two sons who are 18, 20 years old. They've never known a world without the internet. They've never known a world for the last 10 years in which they haven't had a mobile device. We are the only generation in the history of mankind who have met the punch card. We are the only generation in the history of mankind who grew up in a period of time in which computers were going wrong. And it changed our perspective of technology. It changed our perspective of the future. And for some of us, it's made us think about, you know, progress is great, but it's gone on way too long. I, I just want all this change to stop, make it go away. You know, I would prefer if the manufacturing industry didn't bring in all this robotic stuff. I'm tired of dealing with all this change. But we live in an extraordinary period of time. Here's a little cartoon that puts it in perspective. Here is a kid helping his father install some software. OK, Dad, you've loaded the disk. And what you've got to do is you've got to transfer the file to here. You know, and once you do that, Dad, then you're going to double click to open. And the last frame really puts in perspective the unique period of time in which we find ourselves today. See, Dad, that's how you install an internet porn filter. Think about it. I mean, we, we live in an extraordinary period of time. And so what has happened with a lot of baby boomers, you know, we're not comfortable with change. We're not really good, you know, at adopting change. We're not really good at ingesting all the marvelous technologies that we see out in the show floor. And so we become a little bit like Einstein observed. We end up doing the same thing over and over and over again, and we expect a different result each time. That's what Einstein called insanity. But you know about this next generation? They're fundamentally different. This next generation thrives in innovation. They thrive on creativity. They thrive on new ideas. They thrive on the ability to do things in new and different ways. And what is so fascinating about this generation, you know, half the global population at this point in time is under the age of 25. And they're coming into the workforce. They're globally wired. They're collaborative. They're change-oriented. 
And they are now coming into position in, in business organizations, manufacturing organizations, medical device companies, packaging organizations. And they're focused on change and innovation. And they're causing a lot of transformation. Here's a lot going on. The show floor that you will see out there five years from now will not look anything like it does today. It's going to be bigger, it's going to be connected, it's going to a lot of, involve a lot of hyper-connected technology as part of this massive transformation of the world of healthcare, which is underway right now. And what world-class innovators do is they appreciate that fact and they look at trends and they look at the future, not as a threat. Some people look out at the future and they see a trend and they see a threat. Innovators see the same trend and they see an opportunity. What innovators do is they think big. There's massive change underway. They start small. I'm going to experiment. I'm going to try, you know, do a whole bunch of things from what I see going out in the show floor. And I'm going to learn how to scale fast. So I want to leave you with 10 words, you know, that help you think about innovation. Number one, observe. I've had a brief moment in time to share with you a little bit of what is going on, you know, in the world of healthcare, in the world of manufacturing. Think about what these trends mean. Think about what you need to do in terms of change. What do you need to change in terms of your approach to change, your attitude to change? Where do you need to take some risks? You should walk around the show floor and find three ideas out there. When you look at them, you think to yourself, wow, this is really scary. And commit to going back home to your facility and doing those three things. Because you have to force yourself into taking risks in order to get ahead in a world in which the future belongs to those who are fast. You have to banish. You know what I've realized about a lot of organizations? There are people who wake up in every single organization every single day. The very first thought that comes to their mind is what am I going to do today to kill great ideas? Seriously, this is what they do. You know how I know this is true? Think about the phrases they use. Do you ever go to a meeting and somebody says, you can't do that because we've always done it this way? Do you ever go to a meeting and somebody says it won't work? Do you ever go to a meeting and somebody says, that's the dumbest idea I ever heard? You have to banish the innovation killers that cause an organizational sclerosis that shuts down our ability to keep up with a fast future. You have to focus on opportunity. You have to focus on trying to do things. Some of you might be stuck in a rut. You might be complacent about the future. You're not prepared to cope with the future. You have to try to do things you haven't done before. You have to question. We develop assumptions and habits and routines. We have to get away from those. You have to focus on growth. You have to focus on opportunity. What is happening with medical device connectivity is probably the biggest trend to reshape the healthcare industry, bigger than any trend that we have seen in the last 100 years. How are you going to capitalize on that? How are you going to grow from that? How are you going to focus on opportunity? You have to do. You have to have a sense of action. You do those nine things, you get to the 10th most important word of innovation of all, and that's enjoy. Thank you very much, and thank you for spending your time with me.